If you had the opportunity to live in a children's wonderland, would you choose anywhere else? We don't just say, we do. It's the Stained City Way. It's good to have you joining us once again on Real Talk with me, Anele. Addictions, they come in a variety of ways and range from food to alcohol to drugs of all sorts and even porn. The addiction is not only destructive to the addict themselves, but to the family and friends around them. If an addict is ever to escape their prison, they need to go through the grueling, sometimes described as worse than death experience of rehab and recovery. Today I'll be chatting to people from all walks of life who have battled their demons of addiction and live to tell their victorious tales. My first case comes with a wealth of knowledge and research experience that resulted in a postgraduate thesis on the construction of substance abuse in hip-hop culture. Please welcome clinical psychologist Audrey Katizira. What a surname. <laughs> it, it sounds like You've a managed. power punch. Eh? <laughs> Katizira. Hmm. So before we talk about addiction, I want to talk about your thesis. So why specifically hip-hop? Specifically hip-hop because it's the foremost largest youth culture. Oh. It's gone all over the world and, you know, it appears different in different contexts. Uh -huh. mm. And what, what was your most interesting and, and like the one that you recall the most finding about the entire relationship with addiction and hip hop? What I found amazing was that it was really about how people constructed their world. So a person who's within that subculture looks at it as, as normal. That's why you hear people say things like smoke weed every day. It's normal. It's normal it's to my them. world. Absolutely. It's part of it, and I don't have a problem. I can no stop judgment. whenever I want. No judgment. Ah, interesting. How big is your thesis? I may, I may want to read it. You will manage. <laughs> you will manage. So one thing that I always think about when I think, you know, the recovery process of addiction is that uh, it, it does come with a heavy anonymous, I don't know if I can call it cloak. Is that necessary in a recovery phase that people remain anonymous? Well, look, you've actually highlighted something that I think is very fundamental because that actually speaks about the embodiment of shame. The reason why people do not speak is because of that element of stigma and judgment. Yeah. So as people are recovering, they're afraid of that criticism that comes from the outside. Mm. Could the criticism of self when it comes to, you know, doing it anonymously be, you, you know, like sometimes when you go on a diet, you don't tell anyone in case you fall off the wagon and then they see you eating cake and then people are like, ah, but Anele, you said you're on a diet. Now what's happening here with mm -hmm. your carrot cake? You know, we should actually exchange roles because you're now going into self-care. Part of the anonymity comes with wanting to sort of say, I'm going to protect my space. I'm going to tell myself I'm forgiving myself. I'm showing myself self-care. I'm showing myself self-compassion. And some people may not understand my journey, so I'm going to keep it close. So it's twofold. On the one hand, there's that element of people will criticize me. They don't have empathy mm. for me. But on the other hand, it's I now need to exercise that empathy for myself. I need to come out of my shell, but it's my process. And when it comes to, say, the legalities around it, if I'm applying for a job and I'm currently in the recovery phase, am I compelled to alert my employer that, listen, you know, this is something that I'm battling with? Remember addiction or let's say dependence itself, it comes with the ability to not be able to function occupationally. So the fact that you've applied for a job, you've walked into an interview, you've been selected, says something about you. Mm. And so if you're a person who's in recovery, that tells us you're able to function. That's why you find a lot of people who've had a history are able to give back. Mm. So I really think it now goes with the employer and your specific context. It differs from person to person. And in your experience and your studies and your research, when it comes to the recovery phase, what is it heavily reliant on? Is it, is it discipline? Is it, is, is it do repeat, do repeat? What is the, the success of recovery heavily based on? Wow, thank you for asking that. You know, I was actually privileged to sit with some of your guests on the show as well. And, 
you know, what I understood and what I know is that support is really significant. Therapy has moved from you are the problem to the problem is the problem. It's moved from let's talk to this person who has an issue to the support structure to being able to support this person. So we're talking community. We're talking about things such as faith. We're talking about, you know, that sense of understanding that I'm not the only person who's in this by myself. Uh. So I think the, the, the bottom line is really that I'm not alone. I'm supported. And these people are fighting with me. Okay. People that are in isolation are more at risk. And when it comes to, you know, the re let's say the relapsing bit, right? Mm. Is it, it, will everyone relapse? Or, and, and is, it a, is, is it a crucial part of recovery for somebody to, 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 to almost relapse? I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say I to you. I hear you. Yeah. And that's a really tough one, you know, it's quite controversial. Because okay. the medical model will say that relapse will happen you know, experience will say it will happen. Rehab facilities will actually say, listen, you're going to be back here again. Ah. So on the one hand, I'll answer it in two ways. On the one hand, there is that aspect. We can't deny the fact that if you've been habitually involved in something, coming out is a process. Yeah. So that's why I emphasize self-forgiveness. So at least if you're aware, the relapse management becomes, you know, quite manageable because you're able to identify the triggers because it's not just the substance or the specific addiction area mm. or the habits around it, but it's the context. It's the experience, it's the adrenaline, it's the cues, the verbal cues, the groupings. So the reality is that a person needs to be trained to understand their triggers mm. so that they can oh. see it coming. So the more aware you are of triggers with that support, mm. then the better you are at managing your recovery process. And that's why absolute honesty is needed Absolutely. when you're going through the recovery. Because, for instance, if I don't want to get rid of a certain person in my life, but they're a trigger, it means I'm always going to be going through relapses. Mm -hmm. So you have found that people are triggers as well, outside of, you know, the cues and the words and, you know, the, mm -hmm. the environments. Yeah, so absolute honesty is important, but then now consider how we have denial. We have denial because we want to hide, we don't want to be seen. Uh. So we go back to that element of shame. So absolute honesty is important, but the truth is, are we really supported? Because it's so much easier to distance ourselves from the person who we are identifying as an addict. Yes. And then this person may have insight, but they're afraid of coming out as well. Mm -hmm. Let's talk stigmas around addiction, because I, I think it happens with people like, oh, you know, you just, you just need a little bit of self-control. Many people do this. Many people do this and they can control it. You know, what is the biggest stigma around addiction and of all sorts, be it alcohol, be it food, be it drugs, be it porn? You know, I'm going to be very honest with you and say I don't know what the biggest stigma is because I, you know, learn every day from people and I hear so many different things. So if I, if I focus on one thing, I think I'll be doing an injustice to someone else's experience. Okay. Um, but then what I can go back to is that element of self-identity. Uh. The problem with addiction, well... I don't know if problem is the right word because that comes across as quite judgmental. Yeah. But the issue I feel is that when you're dealing with addiction, you're dealing with both shame and guilt. Guilt says, I did something wrong, my behavior is wrong. Then shame says, I did something wrong, therefore I'm wrong. So you're really dealing with that self-critical voice. Mm. You know, that's the biggest thing. So stigma is really around the fact that you're not just experiencing shame from the outside, but you yourself are ashamed. You yourself are your worst critic. Mm. That's why I emphasize self-compassion. Mm. What about... Um because I, I find, so somebody's going through rehab and they're doing well at it and they're not relapsing, but what are the dangers of them finding another thing which is not, you know, drug related, be it running or religion or, or knitting or cooking, where they just find another addiction. Are you aware that people can just transfer their addictive personalities to another thing? Absolutely, we are relational beings. And not only are we relational beings that are thrown into a context that we didn't begin, but we are human beings that are constantly seeking to minimize pain and increase pleasure, you know? So we'll always want to alleviate our suffering. So if I needed this as a crutch, because yeah. that's what addiction is sometimes, we're really trying to deal with our adverse life events. That's why people actually get addicted. We don't know what those are. People have different contexts, right? So I'm trying to deal with this. So I'm holding onto this as a crutch. Yes. This is what's helping me cope. This is so helping as me. I leave this, I need something else. I heard someone earlier talk about support and talk about faith. You, you also now pour yourself into that community or like you're saying something else. Yeah. So I guess our hope is that it's an adaptive thing. It's not something that's debilitating. Exactly. Okay, like you, it's fine, you can go and run afterwards. You're gonna run. be doing Get a athletic. lot of running. <laughs> but it's fine. Oh, Audrey, thank you so much. You really did highlight uh, some very crucial points. Like I say, I'm gonna give your thesis a bash.
<laughs> so I've got nine months off one of these days. Oh, really? <laughs> no, I'm lying. Okay. <laughs> Audrey Katazira, thank you so much, clinical psychologist. Today we're focusing on kicking destructive habits and most importantly, how to confront the problem head on, like Audrey just mentioned. Are you or a loved one battling an addiction or have you managed to overcome one and turn your life around? Tell us briefly on our WhatsApp line in a voice note of 20 seconds. We'll be right back after this. And welcome back to Real Talk on SABC3. The stage is yours. We are almost at the end of Youth Month, but did you know that June is also Anti-Drug Awareness Month? My next two guests have had both their lives affected by drug addiction in different ways. Derylene James is from Stop Drugs, an organization dedicated to the prevention, treatment, and aftercare for those battling drug addiction. And she is joined by Patrick Reardon, a recovering heroin addict who was also dependent on medication for 15 years. Derylene, let me start with you. How is it that you, you know, you come to head up an organization like Stop Drugs? Yeah, this started uh, by default, if I can say that. Uh -huh. My son got addicted to drugs at the age of 14. And um, that's when I, I really, I really wasn't active at the time. Uh -huh. But uh, I tried seeking help at the time for him without any joy. I tried the rehabs. I tried everyone and I just couldn't find help for him. It was just so difficult. It was a dark time in my life. Eventually, in 2013, I authored an open letter to President Jacob Zuma explaining mm. the situation in my community. And once he had left, I was just overwhelmed by everyone coming to my house asking for help. And I think oh, wow. uh, through my son's addiction, I always say this, I found my passion in life. I then started helping other addicts and helping other families who were faced with the same trauma as what I was. And that's how it started. I mean, your son, your, there is no mother who doesn't feel like their child is the most perfect person under the sun. Were you in denial initially about your child being addicted to drugs? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm actually in the middle of writing my book. I remember at the beginning stages, you know, um, I knew there was something wrong, but I wasn't ready to face it. Mm. I recall, I'm just thinking of a specific incident, the one night when he called me to his room and he was sitting on the bed and he was screaming and he was hysterical and he was saying, mommy, there's ants coming at me. And I was like, where are the ants? And he was saying to me, they're coming from the tiles. Can't you see them? I, are you stupid? Are you blind? And I was like, I don't see any ants, but I was feeling so sorry for him mm. because his child was, was terrified. He was sitting on the bed and he had me and his sister getting the mop in the room and actually mopping it just because just to calm, I, him, just down. To calm him down. And eventually I too thought I seen the ads, but later I knew there was something wrong, but I wasn't ready to face it because where do you go to for help? Because if your child has a headache, you know, you can take them to the doctor, you know mm. where to go. But if it's drugs, what do you do? Where do you go? Patrick, you're nodding. Um, mm. You know, you were addicted to heroin for 15 years and also medication. Mm. Okay, first, where do you get the money? For 15 years? You know what, unfortunately, Anil, and thank you so much for having us on the show. You know, I, th I mean, the thing is that, um, you know, you do what you have to. Okay. And um, I found what happened was, is unfortunately through the time, every moral value that I had installed in me mm. started slowly eroding. to be chiseled away and started eroding. And... Um, it led to the point where, you know, everything I said I wouldn't do, the word yet, I just needed to put at the end of the sentence, where I eventually did land up being, you know, homeless in Cape Town um, and having to utilize all that I had, which was Your myself body. and yeah. my body. And, um, and that served its purpose. And I think the important thing to point out is that drug abuse or drug use serves a purpose, mm. but unfortunately it backflips. And the thing is, it no longer serves that purpose, but it gets into such a vicious spiral uh. of dependence where the body actually no longer knows how to live without it. Yeah. And the reality for an addict in that stage, as Darylene speaking about her son, is that it's all very real. And uh. we feel at that point so misunderstood. But the, the culture of addiction uh. is something that I think gets concentrated on a lot. And it's, for me, it's become moving from a culture of addiction into a culture of recovery. Uh. And hopefully now a culture of learning, oh. where Ooh. people are now starting to learn and where more money is invested into learning. Mm. Um, you know, the days of when people came to me at school and said, oh, drugs are bad, um, don't do it. When I used it, they were great. So I thought oh. everyone's lying to me. Because everybody told Cause me they're not good. that's another thing. Like yes. you get some guy to come to your school 
and he's done drugs and he's like, don't do drugs. You're like, uh-uh, don't, don't come and tell us. We're Absolutely. still having a nice life here without drugs. Absolutely. So, what, so what, what, what then works? Think about it for a high school. Let's say I'm a guidance teacher in a high school sure. and I need to make sure that the kids are... Because also the people they bring here, they, they nerf. Drugs are bad. Dolems is for skeletons. You're like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, Absolutely. both of you answered this question. What works? Um, I think... You know, how do we bridge that curio curiosity gap when it comes to kids? You just can't do that. But it's so yesterday telling everyone that drugs are bad for you because in reality, like Patrick just said, it makes everyone feel great. It makes everyone feel on top of the world. Mm. I think we just need to sort of encourage wellness, encourage self-worth, you know, for people to understand who they are. Yeah. Because um, my experience, I felt that there was a void. You know, everyone is looking to fill that void. So you sort of do stuff to fit in. Mm. With my son, he was using drugs to fit in because he wanted to be part of the cool kids. Yeah. The other day, someone was walking past my house and these kids were taking codeine and they were putting it in the Fanta and they were drinking it. And I said to him, why would they want to be doing that? And he said to me, mommy, just to fit in because all the hip hop artists are doing mm. that. So it's just being part of the crowd. But unfortunately, it is, it is wrecking lives. It is really just destroying families' lives. Deridine makes a, a great point, mm. hey, uh, Patrick, because she, because uh, I was reading something you'd said. She says that, you know, drug addiction is the only disease that is frowned upon. Mm. You know, unpack mm -hmm. that. Well, how do you feel about that statement? Well, I mean, I think you can, if you had to liken it to something like diabetes, I mean, people don't look at diabetes and say that, um, you know, that, that you, the, you know, that there's, there, there isn't negative connotations around mm. diabetes. And some of it may be self-inflicted, some of it won't be. For me, there are four main things that stand out when it comes to addiction. Mm -hmm. The one is a false belief system. Mm -hmm. The other is an inability to change situations. Uh, the other is a chemical imbalance. And the other one that's very important is unresolved issues of guilt, shame, and trauma. And like your experts said, when it comes to uh, working from a place of guilt and shame, they're very childlike emotions mm. and we aren't really able to work from that space. It's important to be able to gauge and work from an adult emotional space. So feelings of fear, anger, sadness, joy. What am I feeling in, and, and how can I then work with those feelings? But when I'm operating from a place of guilt or shame, I'm not really able to progress. Mm. Um, mm. So, you know, that's really the problem for me. And I think a lot of the time, as your expert had also said, is that a lot of the focus is on the problem. You know, the thing is, I had a problem. I'm not the problem. I had a problem. Oh, Absolutely. You know, that's um, profound. Um, Darylene, there's a voice note. I think you'll be the best person to answer it. Let's hear it. I would just, I would just like to know um, if you've overcome addiction and you've been clean for a long time, and you have a friend still battling with addiction, uh. is it a good idea to help him knowing that he's still around the same atmosphere? Okay. I think it's entirely up to you, you know, um, are you ready to reach out to someone? Do you have the strength? Do you feel that this person's addiction is actually going to be a trigger to you? Mm. I think it's about understanding where you are, where you're at in your recovery. If your friends and surroundings and circumstances is going to lead you back there, then I would say to stay away. What I do suggest that you do is just support the person, just reach out, you know, connect the person with someone who will be able to, to assist and support them. Um, it's not the easiest thing, but I, I do believe that that confrontation is is all that matters because mm. people don't want to feel judged they don't want to feel the shame on them and this is why a lot of people don't come out and speak out because you're gonna judge me you're gonna say to me even as a parent um, you were poor mother you were bad mother how could your son be on drugs mm. and you keep quiet you're mm. in denial because people are always pointing fingers and um, but it's about how ready you are to to sort of come out and speak out and it is entirely up to you, but there are so many support systems. There's Sanka, there's us, the Yellow Ribbon Foundation. Mm. You know, you can contact us just to try and get support for that person. And also if they're ready for the help. Yo, guys, thank you so much. I think the one thing that stands out besides all your wise words, Patrick, I had a problem. I am not the problem. I hope a lot of people who are battling with addiction that, you know, they'll hold on to and kind of use it to get out of the dark hole that they're in. Your time has been highly appreciated. Uh, this is Real Life, folks. I'm sure some of you at home can relate to Darylene and Patrick's stories, which is why it is important to hear how they've overcome their struggles. More with Real Talk after the break. <laughs> Thank you.
And welcome back to Real Talk. According to a World Health Organization study published in May 2016, South Africa ranks as one of the top 20 biggest drinking nations in the world out of 194 countries. Drinking in many homes and cultures starts before the age of 10. And once many are in their 20s, they've become functional alcoholics. So how much is too much and exactly how do we kick the bad habit? I'm now joined by recovering alcoholic Bradley August, right? So what does the term recovering alcoholic mean? when we're talking about you? Well, Nolene, uh, basically what Do you I... you call me Nolene? Um, <laughs> Bradley, I show you something. Sorry, Nolene, I apologize. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, it's okay. She's my person. So Thank you. Go. What I suffer from is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. Yes, okay. I, I choose to see myself as a recovering alcoholic to always remind myself that my illness is real, uh -huh. you know, it's outside in the parking lot doing push-ups. And so mentally I need to do push-ups as well. In How my recovery. do you do mental push-ups? Well, it starts in the morning with my prayer and meditation, which is also my step 11. Uh -huh. And from there, I choose to practice my five pillars and my 12 steps on a daily basis. So uh, what's step 12? Step 12 would be carrying the message to the still suffering alcoholic after I have had, after I have had, you can say, a spiritual awakening as a result of the other 11. Do you, do you go to step 12 when you are sure of your spiritual being that you are not going to relapse? Yes. Uh, relapse is always a possibility, but recovery is not always. And so I understand that I cannot only just work my steps, I need to practice them on a daily basis. How did you start drinking? Well, I started at the age of 11, just having fun with friends. Uh -huh. And, you know, before, before long, it just spiraled out of control. And before I knew it, I was 16 and drinking during school hours. Okay, so what's rock bottom for you? Well, rock bottom for me was when I, on a personal level, mm. discovered that I had lost everything I have. I had built up over the years, you know, respect, mm. dignity, self-worth, all those mm. things. Are there people who didn't give up on you? Because I know, you know, something like this, you lose so many people around you. Are there those who just refuse to give up on you? Yes, my family as a whole, and especially my aunt. She has uh, walked, this, walked this path with me since I started uh, going, since I went to rehab. Uh -huh. She has still not given up on me till today. And oh. I am always grateful for her. That's beautiful. So did you, you know, in rehab, did you then, because you obviously f um, you are forced, and forced is a terrible word, but you are forced to face something bigger than just the addiction because clearly the addiction is, you know, trying to block something else. Yes, um, as, as I've come to understand, addiction is only a symptom of the, of the illness, which is a deeper lying issue uh -huh. you know and um i actually i don't know i consider myself one of the few or one of many grateful addicts because i was a very tough addict or alcoholic uh -huh. and i did it to the best of my ability uh -huh. and so nowadays i do recovery to the best of my ability and so i grabbed it with both hands and just started running did you ever do drugs or uh yes i did dabble in drugs for a while uh -huh. and as such i do know their side of the story as well. Mm. Because my thing is, you know when you, you, you just have an alcohol problem, you still think you're better because you're like, well, at least I'm not doing cocaine. You know, like look at those guys, they, their life's going down the drain. My drug I can buy legally before three o'clock on a Sunday. You know, did you have that judgy side to you? Actually, yes, in the beginning. Uh, yeah, I used, to, I used to look down on addicts with, uh, with great discontent, uh, with, yeah until I dabbled in it as well and I understood what the illness is actually all about because uh. many people think marijuana is the is the gateway drug but it's not it's cigarettes and then it's alcohol oh all right so we've got a whatsapp voice now let's have a listen hi Anile my question is are there any long-term government facilities for addicts most private facilities are very expensive and most people can't afford it my daughter has been addicted to crystal meth for five years and has been in and out of many rehabs. She's always gone back to the same thing as where it began. It's been suggested that she goes to a facility for a long time, but I cannot afford private facilities anymore. 
So do you know of any public facilities that he can take his daughter to? He might not like my answer, but I will send it to Mahalis Wirt in Pretoria. Uh -huh. Excellent rehab. I was there. You were there? Yes. And I would recommend it any time. And another two would also, we could also uh, consider would be Thames House in Lanasia and Breaking the Chains in Lanasia. Why do you say he's not going to like your answer? Because Mahalis Wirt is a tough rehab. It's not private. There you get down to the nitty gritty of the issue. You will understand what rock bottom is once you enter there. Okay, and did, did you, was that the first rehab you went to or was it your rock bottom, 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 bottom? No, that was the only rehab I ever went to. Oh, and how long was your rehab? Well, I know you're still in the process because we've, we've, we've discussed that, that you're constantly fighting with demons. But how long were you there for? I was there for six weeks. Six weeks. Yes, I tried to stay longer, but they wouldn't have me. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why, Bradley. I wonder why. So listen, this tweet just came in from Wandi at 32. Addiction is preventable when one accepts the problem and goes to rehab. I feel like that's just, it's an easy statement to throw out no, when you don't understand the actual... No, addiction is not preventable. Addiction is a mental... What I suffer from mm. is a mental condition where my mind is constantly trying to, shall I, for lack of a better word, say, kill me. You know, oh. I, 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 I suffer from a spiritual void. And due to that, I have a mental obsession, oh. you know. Oh. My, I want to use to fill that spiritual void. And once I start using, the physical allergy kicks in. And now I cannot stop using. That is why we say that one is too many and a thousand is never enough. Oh, wow. So surely, um, you know, <clears throat> being still part of the recovery process, do you then go for counseling? Are you in therapy? Because outside of the alcohol addiction, the spiritual void, that needs, that, 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 that needs like a psychological attention. Well, I am part of the Alcoholics Anonymous Fellowship and yeah. the Narcotics Anonymous Fellowship. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> uh, we wish to believe that the therapeutic of one alcoholic helping another is unparalleled, mm -hmm. yes? We also have the three pertinent ideas that due to my alcoholism, my, I was powerless and my life had become unmanageable. Mm -hmm. Also that no uh, human, human power could ever restore me to sanity and that only God could and would if he were sought. Mm -hmm. And so our, our, the program is based on spiritual principles and getting closer to the power greater than ourselves, mm. which I choose to call God. Okay. But we are not limited. Are you aware of what your triggers are? Yes, I am. What are they? Oh, too many to name. <laughs> <laughs> but one minute for But you. <laughs> uh, what, what we believe is that there is only one thing I need to change when I come into recovery, mm. and that is everything. People, places, things. I have to find, I have to adapt to this new way of living. Uh. And that is what recovery is all about. And obviously you have to cut people out of your life. Yes, people, places, things. People, places, things. Yes. And I, I, I like the fact that you said, what? Addiction is outside doing push-ups. Yes. So you're always just, you know, a door away from the addiction. Yes. That is why uh, we refer to ourselves as, re as alcoholics or recovering alcoholics, no matter how long we have been sober. Mm. Because there is always that... Uh, that chance yeah. that when I rest on my laurels, yeah. the mental obsession could kick back in. Do you have children? Could, not at the moment. Okay, cool. And, and when you do have children, if you want to have children, what do you know because of your experience you're going to look out for? Well, I'm just going to be there for them. You know, the, 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 signs, the signs are usually, how would I say, there. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily know how, how I, will, I will perceive those signs when they arise. Yeah. But what I know is that um, prevention is better than cure. Yeah. And so I will make sure that I take them to at least one or two meetings a week so they can understand Even the nature of Even before they start, yes. Dad! <laughs> <laughs> Bradley Oak. We'll make it a family day. <laughs> Other kids are being taken to Goro City. <laughs> Bradley's taking them to AA. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, more thank real you, talk on beating addiction after the break. Let me remind you that every week we give you a chance to bag yourself a 5,000 rands e-gift card. Follow the details on screen right now to stand a chance to win this Friday. We'll be back.
Welcome back to Real Talk and today we've been hearing from people who successfully kicked their bad habits. Popular quotes such as nothing tastes as good as skinny feels and a moment on the, li on the lips, a lifetime on the hips have often been used in an attempt to encourage discipline when it comes to developing and maintaining healthy eating habits. My next guest made a huge lifestyle choice when she opted for the route of weight loss surgery. Please welcome entrepreneur PR guru Lorraine Maisel. <laughs> Hello, Nelly. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I've been meaning to tell you, you look absolutely fantastic. Thanks, yeah. Nelly. Like every Thanks. photo you put up, I'm like, oh, go get it, slay them. <laughs> I didn't want to put up photos to start off with because I just didn't want to like, advertise it. But yeah, after two years, you just want to you kind know. of start showing people that you've had, had a, a hard work to get there. Why didn't you want to advertise it in case you like start eating it? It started again? off, you know, you keep, are you scared of failure? I mean, I've been fat most of my life and... Um, the addiction to food is real. Yeah. It's so real. Yeah. And I was just scared, you know, if I failed, if this didn't work, because I tried so many things to become thin. Yeah. Like what? Oh. I remember my mother at 14 took me to a dietitian um, who gave me these hectic drugs that I could never sleep. Oh, wow. But I did lose like 14 Ks in those days. And I was 14. And injections. I've been to doctors. I've been for hypnosis. I've been for... Weight Watchers, Weigh Less, any possible weighing thing that you, you name could it. think, you name it, I've tried Atkins, it. Banting, Atkins, Banting, <laughs> all of these things. Fat-free water, all of it. All of it, you know, grapes and water diets and uh, trying every pull that you could possibly lay your hands on. I've tried it for 25, 30 years. Yeah. Did you ever accept, okay, look, I'm fat. This is it. Let me just be happy. Because, you know, like, I find, like, fat people, we're just always jolly, right? Yeah, so yeah, you were yeah. like... It's like, this is it. Yeah, I kind of got to a point at one particular point, And then one day, I, it just got, you know, when you eat, when you get home at night and you st start stuffing all that food down your throat and yeah. you get into bed and you can't think and your food, is, your head is, is, is in a mess because you're just eating and trying to, you know, pull down these feelings of, of what you're feeling. So, and it's your addiction. It's my, yeah. It was my addiction, you know. Um, so, no, I never got to the point of I just want to be fat. <laughs> oh, okay. But and it's like uh, you wake up every day and you have to put on your clothes and you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, oh man, you know, I wish I could wear this. I wish I could wear that. Did you have like when I'm thin clothes? Yes. Everyone has when I'm thin clothes. When I'm thin clothes, we're sitting in my cupboard for years. Yeah. <laughs> Are you wearing your when they I'm thin clothes? They probably outdated them from 1970. <laughs> so I have a photo of you before you lost all the weight. Let's have a look at that. I take it you're the one with the shades. Yes. Yeah, no, that's a change, hey? Do you, like, struggle to look <laughs> at your photos now? Yeah. What goes through your mind? I can't believe I actually was that big. Do you look at your friends and say, I can't believe you guys let me be that big. Like, you were, no one said, hey, Law, you know, let's, let's do something about your weight. A lot of people did say that to me. My family especially would say, you know, you can't do this to yourself, your health. And they would say that to you. And, you know, you just go, oh, whatever, what are they? And it was. I was, I still went to gym as fat as I was. I know. You, you're like a spinning, like, machine. I love it. I absolutely love training. Um, and I would still go to gym and I'd slide there like a beach dweller on the floor going, mm, I can't get up, you know. Oh. So it started to affect me. It started to take my life into a different, into, into a whole different thought pattern. Oh. Now I can f jump up off the floor and feel good about myself, you know? And did you put your dating life on hold? Because you know you have like the when I'm thin clothes. You also have the when I'm thin, like I'll, that's when I'll get into a relationship. What dating? I was, <laughs> I was too scared to date. Because you have to take your clothes yeah, off at you some have to point. Take your you have to wear those big panties too. So it's not a look. I can't be doing that. So I didn't do that. And now? Never mind. No. <laughs> <laughs> Now, yeah, the dating scene is happening, so it's okay. So how did we uh, decide that we're going to go do the surgery? You know what? It was just, I, I was, one day I was lying in bed. It was a Sunday morning, and I was Googling gastric bypass surgery, and I just, and I was Googling a, a clinic. I needed mm -hmm. to go to a fat clinic. I needed to go to rehab. I needed to go and find a way that I couldn't eat foods that were addictive yeah. to me and to my personality, and I've got an addictive personality. So I was Googling and there was no places to go and I was phoning places. And eventually I spoke to my niece's 
husband, who's a plastic surgeon, uh -huh. who put me in contact with a gastric bypass surgery guy in just in here yeah, in Madron. Yeah. And I landed up there and I just did it and just had it done. But I mean, because you've got, you, you had an addictive personality to food. I know with gastric bypass, you eat like three grapes and a glass of water and you fall. And not anymore. Your stomach grows. Okay. So I've had it two years ago. First of April was two years. Yeah. So it's just over two years ago. Um, so you literally, I mean, you go in with a stomach that big and you come out with a stomach the size of an egg. And you, the first like six or eight months is very hard because you just eat very small portions of liquid. Ooh. And you also have to drink liquid for two weeks before. And it's quite a, it's a, it's a it's process. A and you've got to go for therapy and you've got to go for nutrition and you've got to go and they teach you how to eat and how to chew afterwards. And it's, it's, a, it's a hell of a process. Psychologically, it's a hell yeah. of a process. And there's a, there was a picture of me in my little hospital gown when I, when I went into the hospital. And I remember waking up and going, oh my God, I've had gastric bypass surgery. What's next? You know, it's so scary. Because people have the notion that it's the easy way, you know. But I mean, listening to you, you have to, you know, the preparation before it, the discipline afterwards, the therapy. What did you learn about yourself during the therapy part? I really learned that I didn't like myself fat. Uh. I really learned that. I, as much as I would be on the beach playing bats and my big stomach would be going boof, 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 all over the place. Yeah. I didn't like myself. I didn't like who Lorraine was. Um, and I didn't feel comfortable. I couldn't get off the chair in the beach. And I love the beach. Yeah. You know, I love being in the ocean and I love being in a swimming costume. And, 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 and those are things that were starting to bother me, you know, when I, when I was trying to pull myself up yeah. off the chair in the beach. And I couldn't. And somebody had to push me from behind. Another thing is I went on a, on a, on a trip to uh, Mozambique and um, I, was, I was with a friend of mine. And we were try I was trying to get onto a boat from swimming with dolphins and I couldn't get into the boat. Nobody could pick me up off onto the boat. No, it wasn't a very good look and I had my swimming costume on and there I was and this poor guy started to pull me up and my friend Catherine from behind He's like lifting is from trying, your trying to grab me and there I am. It was, it was horrendous. So I think that was also something that really got me and I really realized that something has to be done. I yeah. just didn't feel comfortable and I was getting older. You know, the older you get, your body can't take yeah. Your body yeah. really struggles. And so now, do you ever feel like, okay, guys, enough with the compliments. Let's move on with new law. Like, because people still see him like, oh, you look so great. Because you, it's just like a flashback to fat self. I still look at myself in the mirror and I go, I can't believe this is me. Oh. So I still, and I like it when somebody says to me, because I think it makes somebody feel good about themselves, you yeah. know? Um, and it's been a struggle. It's been two years of hard labor. You know, I've still got a gym. I still can't eat the foods that I want to eat. I've still got to be careful about what I eat. I can't, I, when I go to an event, I can't just... Eat the canapes. That are, yeah, just the keep pies. eating. And, and you, can eat a, you can eat a normal meal now. Yeah. So you still have to be aware of your food intake and what you're eating. And I train hard yeah. to keep it. I mean, I think there are people that can put on weight on this. Yeah. Afterwards. Yeah. And it, you d don't want it to be you. I don't want it to be me. It's not going to be me. Nice. Lorraine. It's not going to be me. Thank you for your story. And you look fabulous. Thank Just you so much. Way. Yeah, 35 Ks is a, is, a, is, a, is a child. It's Nicole Ritchie. It is. <laughs> It's almost time for us to wrap the show up. Uh, thank you so much to Rola Lorraine Maisel for sharing her journey with us. And thank you to you for all your tweets and your WhatsApp voice notes. You can keep them coming. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Real Talk on SABC3. The stage is yours. In keeping with food addiction, my next guest has literally had people's jaws dropped to the ground over his transformation. Thanks to hard work, sweat, and tears, he went from an unhealthy 140 kilograms at his heaviest to now weighing just 89 kilograms. He is a blogger, entertainer, and one of the members of the Nameless Band. He is my blur. So, do you wear yourself every day to be like, I need to make sure don't get to 90? No, no, no. Um, I've actually gotten to a point where 
um, now it's just keeping healthy. It's working out. I don't like getting on the scale. Like even the 89 that I'm giving you right now, it's because they called and oh. they said what the scale is not your friend because especially when you're trying to gain muscle. So you'll stand on the scale and it'll tell you you are now 92. And you're thinking, you oh, panic. and you panic, but that's not, you haven't gained fat. Because you muscle are... is heavier than fat. Thank you. Oh, okay. Mm. So how did your journey start? I know you were part of a reality TV show. So basically you told the entire country, I'm fat, I need help. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, this journey started at 15. Oh. Uh, where, like... It's so, it's so horrible when you start being body conscious at that age, where you start, you're trying to work out. Because with me, it wasn't even an, an addiction per se. Yeah. It was just that I was just born with a slow metabolism. So I will eat a peanut and gain 10 kilograms. Cool. Like somebody else would be having a donut and tinkies and everything. I know those people. You know those people, right? They probably, I know they have <laughs> bad breaks probably. <laughs> Something must be wrong, my play. So yeah, so with me, it's just, it was always, it became a struggle when I became conscious of myself. Yeah. And then I, would, I was doing aerobics and running. Like, it, I, I remember the first time I dramatically lost weight was in grade 11, uh. which is the time when you shouldn't be worried about gaining or losing yeah. weight. And then I went to varsity. Varsity, it was party time. We were there at Mr. Burger in Grahamstown, you know, <laughs> making, <me. laughs> yeah. fine, making those stops. And um, then I, on my second year, I decided again. I was watching, uh, I, I was in the dining hall. And then there was an episode of Oprah and she was going on, she just lost weight. Is this is where she pulled the fat truck in? Yes, she did. That, you know, yeah. that's the most watched episode? Yeah. So, so basically, I looked at that episode and I said, let me try what she tried. Yeah. And then it's when I lost, I think I lost about 15 kilograms. What did you try? It's just eating healthy. Uh -huh. And just, I realized carbs are not my friend. Uh -huh. Just like how she says, I love bread. Okay. You know, for me, carbs are not my friend. If I start eating carbs, I start gaining weight. So you don't eat carbs now? I don't, I, 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 I stick to the good carbs. Uh -huh. But even then, I limit my portions. Like, mm. you know, it, it, as a guy, apparently you're supposed to have like 2,500 calories a day. A day, which is one pie. Which is, <laughs> 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 but with me, I've, I'm at a point where if I step over 1,700 kil uh, calories a day, I gain weight. So it's just my metabolism. So I had to check myself, and th yeah. that's what I do. So um, you went on the, sh the show, uh, mm -hmm. what was it called? Uh, Boot Camp Mzansi. Boot Camp Mzansi, right? Yeah. Quite public, you know, mm -hmm. like I say, the entire country is aware of it. Mm -hmm. Did you go public to kind of force yourself into a place where you never go back to weighing 140 kilograms? Do, do you know what that show did, uh, did for me? Yeah. And I've been listening to everybody talk about it. What that show did to me, you hold the whole country account, accountable. Like you, so you hold yourself accountable to the whole country because yeah. you, you're there. And um, in that show, I was quite spicy. So when I left the show, I knew that I had to lose weight. I knew that I had to keep it oh, off. Because people are going to be like, whoa. People are like, whoa, you. So it, it, it was one of those things. And I, I like what like, the people before me have been speaking about in terms of accountability. You yeah. need to be accountable to someone. And that show, if there's one thing that that show did for me, yeah. is to hold me accountable. For the way you for look. For the way I look. Mm. So now I make sure, even when I take pictures, I'm just like, everybody's watching. <laughs> you know? Stomach in. Stomach in. Chest, Chest out. <laughs> so it's that so yeah that i I'm, I'm grateful for that and i mean so would you say that you had a food addiction i wouldn't say that okay. I, I wouldn't say that i had a food addiction i just think that one of the things that i got addicted to yeah. was just my couch and tv uh. i got addicted especially when you know when you work from home so you wake up you brush your teeth to the fridge, yeah. you're making food, you sit down, you're on a laptop, you stand up, um, um, you know what I'm saying? And then you forget that, you know, we made different. Yeah. And I, I started piling on the weight. And you, you like, I, I tell people that have actually gained weight through life, like you've gained it and lost it again. <laughs> you know how it is. Yeah. You, you go, ah, no longer 34, 
on, let's get that 36. And then you go, yeah, no longer 36, let's get that 38. And it's so funny because like, you know, you lose the weight, then you get rid of all your fat shorts. <laughs> yes. But the funny thing is when you gain weight, you don't get rid of your thin clothes. Don't, I don't know where the psychology yeah, I, is with that. I, I don't understand as well. Yeah. So it was, it was that. I remember, I literally remember, I, I came back from varsity, I was a size 30. Yeah. I started working in Durban. And then by the time the year ended, that was 2007. Yeah. I was a size 38. Yeah. Like, it happens. Yeah. And then 2008, yeah. I was a size 40, 42. And then by 2010, I was now hitting 44, you know. Then by 20, 2013... Your clothes are being made. You no, know, you know what I'm saying? And there was that section, you know, in the department store. There's that section, you go take me to the... <laughs> you like, I want, I want I the want plus the, size, plus yes, size. You know what I'm yeah. You've got a WhatsApp, let's hear it. <laughs> Hi, Anneli. Um, I'd like to ask um, your guest, Mr. McClure, that um, did being fat or did being overweight affect his personality and confidence? And how did he overcome that? Why are you laughing? That is so, because that is actually a funny, funny question. The bigger I got, the bigger my personality got. Yeah. because I had to compensate for what was happening. Yeah. And so when I walk into a room, my personality walked in first. And it's weird now because even my friends are noticing it and the people that are around me are noticing it and they're thinking it's arrogance. Generally, I'm a shy person. I don't like small talk. I don't like yeah. crowds. I'd rather be at and home. And you're not making excuses for yourself any um, longer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So now I walk into a room and I'm quiet. And people who know me from back then are like, where is? Where is? Because huh? I'd walk in and go, yeah, it's a party. <laughs> and now I'm in there, I'm conscious and I'm chill and I'm just like, hi guys. And it's, it's, it's now as if I'm arrogant, but yeah. it's not. It's just who I am now is comfortable with whatever's going on. What's the best thing about being not fat? Walking into a store. Knowing they've got your side. Hey, no. You know what I'm hey, talking no. about. You know what I'm talking you're about. Like... And, and you yell now. Like back then you go, can I just have a face? <laughs> now you're like, excuse me, I'd like a 34 in black. Skinny cut. Thank you. Where do you keep 34s? <laughs> Medium t-shirt, please. Medium. Oh, you're going to kill me. Stop it. <laughs> you coming. You know, you walk into a department store and you ask. You, now you ask. Is there anybody working here? I need a 34, 34 On pen. that note, a very <laughs> big thank you to all my guests today. The process of overcoming addiction is tough and a lifelong one. But through testimonies like the ones we've heard today, we know that there's always hope and help us out there to regain control of your lives once you make the decision that changes exactly what you want. With that said, enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll see you tomorrow.